Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and that you have brought us here to worship you and to be fed by you. And we pray now that you would speak to us, that your word would be active in our hearts and that your spirit would be moving in this place so that we may grow in our faith in you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, Happy New Year. It is great to see you all here as we begin this new year together in worshiping our Lord and Savior. And as we do that, we jump back into our series on discipleship. We're doing, a, if you've not been here, we're doing a seventh month, seven month series on discipleship where we took a little bit of a break in December. But so far in September, we looked at how disciples learn from Jesus. And it's not just a one time thing, it's a continual thing. That's why we come to worship, to hear the word proclaimed. That's why we come to Bible study, to learn more about God's word. That's why we open up our Bibles and we read it in our personal life. Because through God's word, God speaks to us, God teaches us, and God instructs us. In October, we looked at how disciples share life together. How God has not called us to be lone ranger disciples. But there's a reason why he calls us together as the church. In Hebrews, he tells us that we are to gather together to spur one another up, to do good works, to encourage one another in the faith. And so we gather together for those reasons, but we also gather together as the church because all of us have spiritual gifts and none of us have all the spiritual gifts. But when we come together as the body of Christ, all the spiritual gifts of God are found here in this church and we use them for his glory. And finally, we gather together because it's important for us to actually hear God's love. We know it, but it's important for us to hear again that God loves us. It's important for us to come to worship and to hear that we are forgiven. We know it in our heads, but it's, it's important for us to hear that sometimes. And so God, is, as disciples of Jesus, we meet together as his body of believers, as the church. And then in November, we talked about how we are called as disciples to be faithful stewards of the gifts that God has given us. And we learn that everything that we have is a gift from God. Everything that we have belongs to him, and he has entrusted those things to us out of his deep love for us. And now we are called to be faithful stewards of the gifts that God has given to us. Our time, our talents, our treasures, our families, our jobs, his church, his creation, we'll be faithful stewards of all those things. Now as we jump back into the series on discipleship, in the month of January, we're going to be focusing on how disciples live out their vocations. Now that's a word that we hear often, but I don't think we have a, we have a, we have a proper understanding of how the world uses it, but I don't think we have a proper biblical understanding always of what vocation means. When you hear the word vocation, what does it you think about? A job, right? Somebody earlier today said a school, which is, that's, that's a good answer too, vocational school, right? Those are usually one of the two things you think of, a vocational school or a job that you hold. And, and let me be very clear here. The job that you hold, the work that you do is certainly a vocation. Even from a biblical understanding of vocation, that is a vocation. But if we look at the real biblical understanding of what vocation is, it's much more than just a job. All of you in this room have multiple vocations, multiple, multiple stations in life that God has placed you in, multiple places where you are to be living out your life in a certain manner because God has called you there. So an example of this is, from a biblical perspective, Martin, and this is what Martin Luther would say as well, he would say that as a, as a mother, that is one of your vocations. As a father, that is one of your vocations. As a wife, that is one of your vocations. As a husband, that is one of your vocations. For those of you who are younger in here, as a child, you have a vocation as a child. It matters how you live out your life as a child in relationship to your parents. And then, of course, your job is a vocation, obviously. But there's even more stuff than that as well. What you do, how you volunteer, your life's work, which may not be your job, is a vocation. For those of you who are involved here in church, if you're on a board or something along those lines, a board of directors, a board of elders, I would argue that is a vocation from a biblical understanding as well. So there's much more to vocation than just the job that we do. And over this next month, we're going to be looking at different aspects of that. One of the weeks we will actually be looking at how that looks in our, in our profession, in our professional life, but there's many other aspects of vocation. The most important thing for us to understand when we're talking about vocation is what our primary role is. 
what our primary vocation is, what our primary identity is. And it is not husband or wife, mother or father, son or daughter. It is not whatever your profession is. It is not what your life work is. Your primary vocation, your primary identity is that you are a son or a daughter of God. And everything else that you are flows from that. Every other vocation that you have that you live out is impacted by that one. That is the overarching thing that defines who you are as a child of God. And this is important for us to hear because really what we're talking about today with this is the issue of identity. And this is a big deal in our society today because there's an identity crisis in our society today. Especially among younger people, but not just our younger people, even amongst those of, of us who are a little bit older. There's an identity crisis because too often we, we put our, our hope in the things that we do or the places we come from or the people that we're in relationship with and, and that becomes the identity of who we are. But our identity, our primary identity is in Christ. And that changes everything. That changes how we perceive the world. That changes how we perceive ourselves. And that changes how we live out our other vocations as well. So I want to share a story with you that I I hope illustrates this point maybe a little more clearly than than I have up until this point. I hope I've been clear, but if not, hopefully this story will help out. It's about a king who lived in a country far away, long ago. And he decided, he was a good king, he decided one day he wanted to have a, a special banquet. He was going to invite everyone in the kingdom. The only prerequisite for coming to that banquet was that you had to wear banquet clothes. You could be the poorest person in the land. If you had clothes that were appropriate for a banquet, you were invited in. There was one particular person, though, who lived next to the castle. He was a beggar. He'd been a beggar his entire life. One of the poorest people in the kingdom. Lived in rags. He had no way of of being able to, to get the the robes that he would need to go to this banquet. But he wanted it more than anything because he thought if he can get into this banquet, maybe his life would change. And then the thought hit him that every now and then the king had a, a, an open court where people from the village could come in and, and share their grievances with the king. So he decided one of these days to go in there and speak to the king. And when he arrived, he said, Oh, king, you are a great king, and I would want nothing more than be at your banquet. That's what I desire more than anything but I can't come because I don't have the proper attire to attend. Is there any way that you can give me one of your old robes so that I can go to the banquet? And the king was overjoyed that this this beggar had come to ask him that. And he said, of course, of course I have a robe for you, but I got more than that. From now on, you're not going to live on the street anymore. There's a room for you in my house. And you're not going to have to worry about food anymore. You're invited to sit at my table every single night. Of course you're welcome. My son will come and give you a robe. Take, take, him, to your, take him to his room and give him his new clothes. And so he took him to the room, gave him his new clothes, and he put on this banquet robes, and he was ready to go to the banquet. He was excited for everything that was to come. And he was about to walk out the door, and then he looked back, and he saw his rags lying on the floor. And the thought entered into his mind, well, what, what if the king changes his mind? What if I don't get to stay here forever? And so he went and he picked up his rags and carried them with him. He picked them up, brought them to the banquet table, sat down, and did not enjoy the party at all because he was so concerned about what was going to happen. Would the king change his mind? He held on to his rags and was focused on that the entire time. But what was amazing was the king didn't change his mind. He was allowed to stay in the kingdom the rest of his life in the king's castle. But every single day he walked around carrying his old rags, being worrying about what was going to happen to him. He became known as the rag man by all the people in the, in the castle. And then finally one day he was, he was sitting there on his deathbed and the king came to visit him. When the king came in, he didn't even say anything. He just looked at him and smiled and he had compassion in his eyes. And all of a sudden, the guy realized, I've exchanged who the king has made me for holding on to these rags. He, he gave me everything. And I wanted that. See, he'd been given a new identity by the, by the king, but he held on to what he had been. He held on to his identity as a beggar because he was worried of what would happen. Sometimes I think we are a lot like that beggar. 
the king has invited us into his kingdom. He has given us, the, he, has, he has called us his sons and his daughters. He has given us royal robes. He feeds us. He welcomes us into his home. And we hold on to what we once were. We hold on to our sin and our shame and our guilt. We hold on to what other people think of us, what other people say of us. We seek to find our identity too often in other things besides who the king has made us to be. And as we're talking about vocation and identity, we need to understand the king has given us everything. He has made us his sons and his daughters. And everything else that we have should flow from that knowledge, should flow from that work that God has done for us, should flow from the fact that Christ has died for us, raised, rose, risen from the dead, and has brought us to new life in him through the power of holy baptism. And my prayer for us is that today we would see that, that what we hold on to, the ident- places we try to find our identity, will leave us empty. When we find our identity at the cross, we are filled. To do that, I want to take a little bit of time today to look at each one of the texts that we read from Jeremiah chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and John chapter 15. We're not going to spend much time in any of these verses, but each one of them speak to this idea of vocation and identity found in Christ. And so the first one today is from Jeremiah chapter 1. There's a few verses I want to read to you. God is speaking to Jeremiah, and he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, Behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth. For to all whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Now this is an interesting, and Jeremiah is an interesting character. He's called the weeping prophet. If you want to know more about it, you can come to Bible study in the future. We did a little bit on Jeremiah today. We're probably going to do a little bit in the future as well. But he lived a very difficult life. But he was faithful to listen to what God had to say. But it's interesting here as well. God says, I knew you. I made you from the very beginning. When you were in the womb, I knew you. And I put you together, Jeremiah. I called you from the very beginning. And Jeremiah says, but I'm too young. And Jeremiah was young. Jeremiah was probably 16 or 17 years old when God called him to do this. So he was a legitimately very young man. And he said, I I, I don't have the words to speak. And God says, you're not too young, Jeremiah. If you are my child, if I put you together in the womb, and if I tell you that you can do this because you are my child, then you can do this. And you may not know what to say, but you don't have to worry about that because the words you're going to speak are going to be my words, not your words. And you may be afraid, and there may be good reasons for you to be afraid, but you don't need to be afraid, for I am with you, Jeremiah, because you belong to me. In the same way God speaks to us in our doubts and our fears and our excuse making. There are times in our life where we are afraid just like Jeremiah was. There are times in our life where we do feel like we're inadequate. I am not smart enough. I am not good enough. I am too young. I'm too old. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not good enough. And God says to us in each one of those situations, yes, you are, because I made you. I called you. I I have made you my child. So don't say you're not good enough. Don't say you're not, whatever the excuse is. It's not true, because I have told you something differently. You are who I say you are. And if I say you are my child, if I say you can go to, to, to go and do this, then you should know that you are my child and I will be with you. He spoke those words to Jeremiah and he speaks those words to each one of us today as well. So that's the first passage we learn about identity in Christ. The second one is 1 Corinthians chapter 17. Excuse me. Chapter 7, verses 17 to 24. I'm just going to read a few verses from there as well. St. Paul writes, Only let each person lead the life the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all churches. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a slave when I called you? Do not be concerned about it. 
But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a slave of Christ. You are brought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Now this is an interesting passage, and I'll be honest with you, it probably makes some of us in this room uncomfortable, right? It almost sounds like St. Paul is giving a stamp of approval on slavery. And that, of course, would make us uncomfortable. That's not what St. Paul is doing here at all. What St. Paul is saying to the church in Corinth is this. It doesn't matter what you were before. If you were free, if you were slave, if you were rich, if you were poor, whatever it was you were before, it doesn't matter. What you do does not define who you are. What defines who you are is who you are in me. What defines who you are is, is what I say. And so he's not condoning slavery here. As a matter of fact, he says, if you can get out of slavery, get out of slavery. But what he's telling people is, it doesn't matter what, what your profession is. It doesn't matter what your status in the world is. Even if it's something as horrible as slavery, it doesn't matter. Because in Christ, you have been set free. So if we were to take this into a a context today, it'd be something along the lines of this. If you are a plumber, keep plumbing. If you are a doctor, keep doctoring. If you are a stay-at-home parent, keep staying at home and being a good parent. If you are a pharmacist, keep pharmacizing. Whatever it is that you have done before, you don't have to change what you've done What matters is, have you you been changed at the core of who you are? And if you are a disciple of Christ, the answer is yes. It doesn't matter what your profession is. It matters who God has made you as his child. And the important thing for us to understand this, again, is this. That now that we have been made new in Christ, this does impact how we live our life as we carry out the other vocations that we have. If we are living first and foremost as a child of God, then we will work for the glory of God, and our work will be even better than it is if we're working for something else. So I said this a few months ago when we were talking about stewardship. We should not be working for a paycheck. We should not be working for a company, for for their profit. We should be working for the glory of God. Now that may sound really weird, but hear me out on this. If we are working for the glory of God, then we will be more of a blessing to our company than if we're just working for a bottom line. I I truly believe that. If we are working for the glory of God, God is still going to provide for us and give us the things we need in our paycheck. But the reason why we work and how we work should be for the glory of God, not for these other things. And that is not something that would, would detract us or make us worse workers in our professions. It'll make us better. But everything we do, we do the glory of God because that is who he has made us as children. So we learned that from 1 Corinthians. And then finally, the last passage today was from the Gospel of John, chapter 15. Just a few verses here for you where Jesus is speaking. And he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear, bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. Now, there's a lot more that Jesus talks about here in that passage, a lot about love and how we are to love each other. But I, when we're talking about this idea of identity, I think it's important for us to understand this today. What does Jesus call us in that passage? Branches. Do branch, is there just a disembodied branch out there living on its own? No, of course not. The branch finds its life, its identity, the fruit it produces, that finds all of that in the vine, in the tree. Jesus is that tree. And so as he's saying this today to us, to the disciples and to us now, he is saying, I am that vine. You find your life in me. You find your identity in me. And when you do that, you will bear good fruit. And it's it's not so that you can pat yourself on the back and say what a good person you are. It's just going to happen. Because if we are abiding in the tree, then our fruit will be, the fruit we produce will be Fruit that brings glory to God. 
And so as we look at all three of these passages today, we learn something about who we are as individuals and most importantly, who we are in Christ. We are his children who are redeemed, who are forgiven, who find life in him. And everything else we do now, every other vocation that we have, you, how, how you live your life as a husband or a wife, as a mother or a father, as a son or a daughter, as an employer or as an employee, as, as a volunteer anywhere else, how you live your life will change when you are understanding your first identity is as a child of God. My prayer for us as a church is that over the next month as we we look at other parts of vocations that that we will keep this in mind and that this will impact how we look at all those other things. But more importantly today, I want you to know, especially if you are here today and you are struggling with where your identity is found, that God loves you very much. God cares for you deeply. And he has called you his own. You don't need to search for identity in a sport, in a job, in a relationship, in, in, in what country you're from, or any of those things. God has given you your identity, and it's found in the cross of Christ and in the empty tomb. Amen. And I'm with this God of grace and mercy who calls you his own, be with you all the days of your life. Amen.